I had major seizures in the hospital. I get a lot of like brain fog and a lot of all these things. You don't know when you take an overdose exactly what happens. By you saving someone, you don't know the outcome. And they may not live the life. Look at me. Hey there, my name is Sean, and this is Suicide Noted. On this podcast, I talk with suicide attempt survivors so that we can hear their stories. Every year around the world, millions of people try to take their own lives, and we almost never talk about it. We certainly don't talk about it enough, and when we do talk about it, many of us, including me, we are not very good at it. So, one of my goals with this podcast is to have more conversations and hopefully better conversations with attempt survivors. Now, if you are a suicide attempt survivor and you'd like to talk, please reach out. Hello at SuicideNoted.com on Facebook or Twitter at Suicide Noted. And you can reach out for other reasons as well. Maybe you have a question. Maybe you have a comment. You want to learn more about our membership. Check the show notes for that, among other things. Maybe you just want to share some things and have me read it aloud. That's a possibility too. We're open. Ideas. Let's do it. Now, of course, we are talking about suicide on this podcast, as the name suggests, like we've been doing since the summer of 2020. We do not hold back. So please take that into account before you listen or as you listen. But I do hope you listen because there is so much to learn. Today, I am talking with Sari. Sari lives in England and she is a suicide attempt survivor. Hey, Sari. I never, ever go on Zoom. I do anything not to go on Zoom, so... And so all the more reason why I'm grateful you're here. Thank you. S-A-R-I. How do I say your name? The English like to call me Sari. The Americans like to call me Sari. (laughs) Make of it what you will. I lived in the States for 16 years and I had my name botched, so... Right. I'll call you Sari. Okay, that's great. No, I'm not a bloke. I'm just a dude from the States. What part of England are you in? I'm in London. Where'd you live in the States? I lived in New York. So I went to New York for undergrad and master's, ended up staying there for almost 16 years. When did you go back to London? This relates to taking an overdose, one of many. Mm -hmm. And it was quite a almost fatal one that left me while I was in hospital I got two hospital born um, infections okay that left me paralyzed this is probably part of our conversation yes it's definitely part of the conversation so I'm thinking we might want to get here later (laughs) we'll we'll manage I promise so but what this means, sorry, is if you were if you back in London in fourteen, which means you got to this New York in the late nineties. Yes, I did. I got to New York in ninety six, and you left in about February two thousand fourteen. Do you know what that means? <laughs> I don't. For the better part of at least eleven years, you and I were in the same city. Really. Yeah, I'm from New York. I lived in the city. We call it the city, if you're listening out there. It's not London. It's the city. Um, I lived mostly in Manhattan. I finished my tenure there, even though I'm from Long Island originally in uh, Queens. So uh, where did you go to undergrad? I did undergrad and master's at Parsons School of Design. So you're a designer. I was. I have lost use of my hands due to contractures, so I can't write or do anything in that realm anymore. It was a big overdose. Right. Was that an intentional overdose? Oh, they've all been intentional. Okay, we're going to get to that stuff. Yeah. Did I say thanks for being here? No, but thank you for saying that. <laughs> of course. <laughs> all I know is that your home is got is bright. I can see that a little bit behind you. We don't have to reveal the details of where you live, of course. <laughs> I mean, who knows who's out there? Jeez. Yeah, exactly. You've shared a couple of things already that I want to get back to. 
When did you find the podcast? Last year. I think it was pre the overdose, actually. I wasn't looking for your type of podcast. I was actually looking more for a podcast to tell me methods. I think it's interesting that you were looking for a podcast and to find essentially out how to do it. I'm pretty sure you didn't find that podcast because it doesn't exist. I actually found something that led me to something. Sanctioned suicide. Yes. My father was passing away. I had basically looked after him for from Alzheimer's for the past nine years. And last year, last summer was... I couldn't watch what I was watching anymore. If anyone's gone through watching the final months of Alzheimer's, it's the most cruel thing that you could watch. It truly is. And I was incredibly close to my father. And I ended up going through some kind of psychosis. I kind of go through these periods where I can feel the suicides coming up. I know it's going to happen. I want to understand... When you were looking for something for a podcast, you were looking for ways or methods. So all of my attempts have been overdoses. Yeah. Now, when we go back to the very first attempt. We will. To what has been the very last attempt, we've gone from like a baby to my last four have been all nearly fatal. Yeah, you learn. I want to better understand from people I talk to what it is. This isn't me. I don't need my ego stroked at all. What keeps you listening? I ended up taking the overdose and I ended up, it was near fatal. I was in um, a coma for, I think, nine days. I was in the hospital for three weeks. The only reason I didn't go into a psych ward was the unfortunate passing of my father. Okay. So they let me out. And then when I got out, found the podcast again, Mm -hmm. and I started re-listening, and I understood what it was about, that it wasn't what I had been looking for in the past. Now it's like, oh, this is something really different, and maybe I could learn something from this. Maybe I could, listening to other stories could be helpful in a time like this, and I think I listened to almost all your episodes in a matter of three days. Wow. That's called a binge. Don't forget I'm paralyzed and Mm. they didn't move me for three weeks. So when I came out of hospital, I was incredibly weak and it took a long time for me to get strong and recover and do the rehab. So I had nothing to do except podcast, Netflix. You heard a lot of this guy blabbing away. I did. It's right. been 25 years, so chronic suicidal ideation. And how old are you, may I ask? I'm 46. All right. Okay. Looking youthful. Thank you. There's a lot of people who listen. There's not nearly as many people who reach out. So that's the thing I want to ask you. Why actually talk with me and presumably share it with you know whoever listens to this, wherever they are? That was a really good question because for so long I thought, God, I'm never going to... I share my story with people that I know. I have no problem talking about it with people that I know. There was just a feeling one day that there are so many different stories out there. None of us are the same. I think it just goes to show people really don't understand suicide. 100%. And even the doctors themselves. And I hope that there are doctors listening in on this podcast, which Mm -hmm. I don't think there are. I really hope it reaches that one day because they could learn a lot. Just goes to show that it's an unknown, you know. I wonder if you're in the majority or the minority of people who are, at least until this point, more comfortable sharing it with family, close friends than they are strangers. I think if I had to guess, I'd say more people are comfortable sharing it with strangers. My family does not want to. Oh, so you don't talk about it with them or you stopped. I do. They had to come to therapy with me, but they don't want to. That must suck. I have one sister. She's a psychologist. She's very supportive. My other sister, who's a doctor, does not want to know. My brother thinks I should 
thank him for saving my life. My mother doesn't want to know. Not wanting to know doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That's an interesting dynamic. Okay. Yeah. She would like to think it doesn't exist. You're going to share this with them when it comes out, do you think? Or maybe just the one sister? Probably not. I don't think they have the emotional intelligence to listen to it. Okay. When you were 21, this thing started. Before you were 21. I was sent to a Church of England boarding school. Mm. My mother's Jewish. My father's Muslim. Yeah. Your mother is Jewish. Yeah. And my father is Muslim. And then, and your dad, Muslim, may I ask what country is he originally from? Or his parents? Or his parents' parents? Iran. Okay. So do you speak, is it, what is it, Farsi? Well, I left when I was like one. Because of the revolution. Now this is getting to be a history podcast. I love it. So you left Iran slash Persia when the Shah was booted by the Ayatollah Khomeini. Exactly. All my siblings were much older than me and they only spoke Persian. And and Hebrew, I must say. My parents speak Hebrew and Persian together. It should be noted for our listeners that there was a long period of time in Iran where there were a lot of Jews and they had a quote-unquote normal There are, there are still 40,000 Jews in Iran today. So oh. we came here when I was very young. And because of that, they only spoke to me in English so that the others would learn English. I Picked up some Farsi along the way because my aunts and uncles, I could speak it like broken. I mean, like very pigeon, yeah. understand it fully. I would have been happy to do this in Farsi, but if you can't speak at a high yeah, level, I'm I mean, sorry. Can, it's not on me. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're not doing that. Oh, and um, we're not doing it in Hebrew either, just by the way. No, definitely not. <laughs> You'll do your British English. I'll do my American English. Who cares? It's English. Coming over here was quite tough. I had a very bad relationship with my mom, still do, very good with my dad. But I was sent to boarding school. I chose to go to boarding school because I didn't want to stay at home. But it was very evident that I wasn't English. There was quite a lot of bullying going on, but I do not blame that for my issues. It just kind of, that's where things sort of stopped started to go on but i don't think any of that is to do with what was to occur later okay it was just a shitty upbringing i moved to new york i found my freedom best time of my life that i could have had because i think i was away from my family new york in the late 90s was pretty cool i think i mean we made it cool i think yeah i kind of messed up because as a foreign student, you get a one-year visa to stay on. I am the biggest procrastinator in the world. Like, it's just a very bad trait of mine. I just... Especially bad with visa stuff. Well, exactly. Lo and behold, I didn't get visa. Okay. And I was too scared to tell my parents that you know, that she spent all this money on college and I wasn't staying a year to work. And I don't know how there are eating disorder issues in my family. I'd never had one until then. All of a sudden, it just like hit me like a bullet. I think out of anxiety, started binge eating. I was Uh so nervous about telling my parents and about all of this. I didn't understand it and I hated the feeling so much because I'm also the biggest control freak. You're so out of control in that situation. Mm -hmm. So my first overdose was that summer and I took 200 Tylenol. With the intent to die. Every single one of my overdoses has been with the intent to die. Do you know how many overdoses you have? It's roughly about 18 right now. And this goes from 21 till, when was your most recent one, last year? Last August. So at 21. I woke up the next day, just maybe even not the next day, maybe two days later, and I just ran to my bathroom vomiting. And I was like, well, that didn't work, you know, clearly. 
And I remember just going to a deli and buying like the biggest bottle of Coke I could find. And I was like, that's all I could stomach. I was like, shit, okay, well, my parents coming for graduation in two days. I'm, I'm going to tell them. And I told them and whatever, I moved back to London like two months later. I did tell them about the overdose and I was sent to every psychiatrist and every whatever, put on a hundred different meds that made me so insane. When pretty much immediately, as soon as I got to London, I took another overdose with all the meds that I was on, which was a lot. At that time, they were prescribing benzos like candy. I was found pretty quickly. I mean, obviously that overdose wasn't going to work, but I was put in a psych ward. Psych ward number one or only one? Yeah. Oh, no. There have there been plenty of psych we have to We have to figure out with your story here which things to go deeply with and which not, because 18 overdoses. Yeah. So there are only really a few that need to be. So... This was psych ward in an English, and I'm all for the NHS, but there are some things that are quite interesting. Let's just say that. I was a chain smoker at that time, and I literally then had gone from binge eating to not eating. So I went from chain smoking to like just not eating and refusing to talk to anyone. And my parents were like, okay, we've got to get her out of there. And we had insurance, and so they put me in a private hospital, and that was even worse. Is that right? Yeah. My sister was getting married September 1st, so I had to be out before the wedding. So we manipulated it so that I got out. How many days or weeks were you in both hospitals for that you know, whole thing? About a month. Was any of it helpful? No. It was a month to please my parents, to say, okay, we're doing something. Did you get to your sister's wedding? I did. So I stayed in London for a few years and actually was pretty stable for a number of years. No attempts. No. Kind of interesting to hear because it doesn't sound like anything else changed. Well, I think the eating disorder wasn't there. And that's what threw me initially. I started working, but I hated London. And all I wanted to do was go back to New York. That's music to my ears, Sarah. My parents agreed that I could go and do my master's in New York. Back to Parsons. Parsons we go. New York is, for me, like the greatest city, but it's also a very, I'm missing something. And this is what I do. I dissociate from it. When I was 22, I went away with my parents. This is very hard to talk about. I was raped by two people for 12 hours straight at gunpoint. Thing is, is that I dissociated from it for 10 years, blacked it out. This now leads into the major overdoses because when I was about 31, I started having hallucinations. I started remembering things, remembering that something had happened to me and I didn't know what. I became quite psychotic. I was doing like crazy things. Like I ran out of my apartment one night into like Central Park with no shoes on in the middle of winter and snow. And like, I was just doing like weirdest things. And I was being sent to doctors and they said, we we don't know what's wrong. And I took a major overdose. Just so the timeline is clear for people who are listening. You go back to London. You're yes. in a hospital. You, you go to a hospital, two hospitals for about a month. Yes. At some point around that time in your life, when you said you were getting stable, this thing happens where you were assaulted yes. at gunpoint. Yeah. You disassociate. At some point after that, you go to Parsons for your grad school. Yes. At some point during or after grad school, because you're able to stay in New York for a while, it sounds like. Yes, because I'd got the visa this time and I'd carried on getting visas so I could work and I stayed in New York all the time. And in New York, some something happens and you aren't okay. I stopped having flashbacks. How old were you about then? Do you, do you remember? Like It was about 10 years later. So your 20s, once you go back to New York, are kind of stable. 
They're kind of stable. I have a lot of anxiety, but they're kind of stable. And something happens around a Thanksgiving, right? It was weekend of Thanksgiving. I went to my friends. I just couldn't handle being in that environment. There was something there that was triggering me. And so I left early. And on the Friday night, I took an overdose. And it was a very large overdose. And I was thinking, oh, everyone's on Thanksgiving. No one's going to notice that I'm not around or whatever. On the Monday morning, apparently um, a friend had been trying to get hold of me the whole weekend and he realized like that he couldn't get hold of me. And so he actually came to my building and he got them to knock the door down. And the paramedic said, had it been 10 minutes later, I would have been dead. Let me ask you a question. Am I mad? That's one of them. Yes. You've listened to the podcast? Yeah. Not only that, were you mad then? Do you remember? So I went into the hospital. I was out of it some time. I think I was there for two weeks. And then I went into inpatient into, I don't know, you know, St. Luke's up on 116th. I used to live up near there. That's one crazy impatient. Let me tell you. No, I haven't been inside. Yeah, it's, it's not fun. And I was there for seven weeks. Oh, Jesus. I could write a book about that experience. Well, you know I'm the king of memoir titles, so we can get it, we can get it yeah. rolling right now. Seven weeks, seven weeks is a good title. Seven weeks. I'm just saying it's a gift, sorry. Again, I don't want to gloat, but... No, but I mean, it's got to be seven weeks in... Subtitle. Okay. It's your memoir or book, you do whatever you want. You know, if I have a superpower, I'm going to just talk. I got to use it. Yeah, that was back in 2010-11. Back in New York, you're dealing with anxiety. You're mostly, we could say, stable-ish. And then you have the Thanksgiving and almost dying and being in a hospital called St. Luke's for several weeks, which sounded very, very awful. I mean, the amount of times, like, if you did something wrong, they would just sedate you, handcuff you to your bed. It's not called St. Luke's Prison, but we could. Yeah. We could, and people might scoff at that. No, you're wrong. I am telling you, you're not right. Yeah. But when you get out of this place. I got out of this place, and I immediately found a very good trauma therapist which is what I was instructed to do because they realized that I was having these intense flashbacks. From the assault. And they didn't, well, they didn't know what, because I hadn't told them that. But they knew something was going on. I had this really good therapist that I was with for about three years. And she was the one that sort of got me to experience Trauma therapy is the most horrible thing. Yeah. You experience all the memories. You go through it as though it's physically happening to you. I mean, I was hysterical for weeks. And that's when we realized it happened. I actually remembered exactly who it was. It was two people that I knew. Can I can I ask about this or no? Yeah. So so just to be clear, two people that you knew. Yeah. Stalked you for 12 hours at gunpoint. So I was in Israel and they were Israeli soldiers. And one of them was my friend, boyfriend. Were they caught? Do you know? It was too late. And we could have gone that route. So we went, rather, my dad went and looked into it. And they were said it's a very high chance that because there's no physical evidence, they're not going to get caught. And then the victim feels like they're being re-victimized all over again. And so it's a dangerous game you're playing. Yeah. Your parents knew about that. Well, I was in therapy and we sort of got to the point that I was told to tell them because they could never understand why I was taking all these overdoses. And so now it finally came out. 
my mom said the most awful thing to me. She said, well, girls only get raped if they ask for it. Yeah, I kind of lost it. Still a bone of contention with us today. I carried on this trauma therapy for a while, but it ended up becoming a bit too much for me. It was like, it was bringing out too much. It was bringing out like, it's almost like you're vomiting your life. And it's like, you've got nowhere for it to go. You can't channel it. Mm -hmm. Or at least I had nowhere to channel it. And so I just started to go a bit more crazy. That was when... On New Year's Eve of 2013, I took my worst overdose yet. In New York City? Yeah. And I had been hoarding this overdose for about four months. Oh, so you were planning. I was waiting for it to come. And it was probably the worst cocktail of medicines you could ever get. I'm not going to say it because I don't want anyone to hear this and think, oh, that's a great cocktail, but it was bad. This was the kind of podcast you were looking for originally. Well, yeah, exactly. You had been back in New York for several years. Yeah. Particularly when you start to go to this particular or the trauma therapy, are you able to function day to day? This is the crazy thing. I'm extremely high functioning, especially under pressure. So I was working almost 14 hour days, 15 hour days. Like I said, I was existing on cigarettes, coffee, and froyo. They don't make a cigarette or tobacco flavored froyo, do they? No, but they probably should. You probably should. Hello, I want to be part of this business partnership. Were you in the design field? No, I was actually working for investment banks. They consolidate it out like for their ultra high net worth clients. They want special events done. You lost me at investment banking, to be honest. Sorry. Yeah. All right, cool. A job's a job. A job's a job. New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve, I took a very bad overdose. This is the one that I only found out last year that my brother who was living in Moscow, came to knock my door down. How did he know? They knew because my parents had just been with me and they said that I was acting off and they felt another overdose coming on. And so it was three days later that he got to me. I was out. I was sleeping like a baby. You take the overdose so he gets there on like January 3rd or 4th? Yeah. So you were literally almost unconscious the whole time? I was unconscious the whole time. That's not sleeping like a baby. That's almost dead. Is that the same thing? Well, yeah, that's what the paramedic said. And again, I went in, I was in a coma for about, I think this one was about four or five days. And this is the one that my brother wants me to thank him for saving my life. And I said, but I never asked you to, so I'm not going to thank you. Right, because what he didn't understand is you wanted to die. Exactly. So he saved you from what you wanted. Exactly. It's more than 10 years later. Do you wish you had died? Yeah. Do you wish you had died on all your attempts? Yeah. Not then, I mean now. Yeah. So you don't want to be alive? No. And then I'm not going to ask you the pink and purple pill question because I know the answer. Exactly. Okay. Can we go back to the hospital? So I'm in hospital and I caught both C. difficile and Campylobacter at the same time. Like They're what? both hospital-borne infections. I don't know how common they are. Wow. And I remember they were getting me ready for discharge to send me to another psych ward. And they said, okay, you know, you haven't walked for a few days. I think it had been two weeks. They said, let's see how your walking is. I stood up and I literally fell like a raggedy Ann doll, just collapsed. And the doctor looked at me and he's like, why did you do that? And I said, well, I didn't exactly do it on purpose. So you were already paralyzed? Yeah. It's called Guillain-Barre syndrome, and you become paralyzed within 24 hours. 
The reason why so many people don't know about it is that most 80% of people that get it recover within a week to a year. I am part of the 20% that won't recover. So it gets to a point, whether that's a year or whatever it is, where now it's not reversible. When did you learn that you were, was it that moment? So I was in hospital in New York for six weeks in the ICU, and then my insurance started putting the brakes on. I think at that point, we'd reached like the $500,000 level. And so they're treating mainly this new thing that you just got. Yeah. That's why you're there for that long. Yeah. And so I got air ambulance back to the UK. I was in hospital for 10 months before I came home. 10 months? Yeah. Doing what? I was in ICU for about three months. And then the rest of it was rehab. Because I was paralyzed head to toe. The way it works is that you become paralyzed toe to head. When you gain your um, nerve function back, it's from your head to toe. So it took about six months for my arms to move. And then finally, I got to the point where now I'm up to my hips. But this was 10 years ago, so I'm not going to get any more function back. So right now, you don't have the function like of, of waist down. Yeah. And like I said, I have contractures in my hands, so some yep. of my hand movements don't work. And at the time, it should be noted, like you're in your mid-30s. Yeah. I'm going to ask this question because we're talking about suicide. I don't mean to like pour fuel on fire, so to speak. Don't worry. When you realize that you were paralyzed, you were already before you were in the hospital originally because you overdosed because you wanted to die. I, I'm trying to imagine, of course I can't, but one yeah. tries their best to put oneself in shoes, right? Others, shoes. A suicidal person enters a hospital and now they're paralyzed and now they're somewhere else, another country. This woman in her mid-30s in a hospital for a very long period of time, and for much of that, you either can't move at all, or you're having to work really hard to get some access to some of those things back. And all the while, you don't want to be alive, I'm imagining. So how do you do the therapy? How do you do the rehab? What makes you do that? Because I would imagine a lot of people, some people, this person would be like, nah, fuck that. It was the only way for me to get home. And believe me, you don't want to be in hospital. So I sort of thought through it as in, let me do this to get home. Okay. I'm never left alone because I need people all the time. You know, it's very hard to do things without people. I drop a phone, I need your help. There are people around me all the time. In fact, this is probably the first hour I've had to myself in like the longest time ever. And it's pretty nice. So planning suicide. <laughs> Did you start planning in the hospital once you knew, all right, I'm going to get out and I'm going to kill myself? No, actually I didn't. Again, I was quite stable for about six years. So did you, so you came to accept this is going to be your life? I don't know if the words accept, but. Maybe accept is the word. Life was just different. This is going to sound very weird, but big part for me was that, you know, the rape had had such a profound effect on me. And it was like, well, here I am, I'm in a chair, and now no one's going to want to look at me. I am not attractive to anyone. Else. No one is going to want to talk, you know. And so that has almost become, I'm invincible to me. Invincible or invisible? Invisible, sorry. So it's like, I think that protects me. And I feel better because of that. That has made me better in some way. Wow. Yeah. It hasn't taken a lot of the shit away, but it's taken a large chunk of it away. I'm going to try to articulate something that just came up for me. The idea that, and I'm paraphrasing some here, losing your body and you're in a wheelchair. Yeah. And the fact that for years now you've been, and I don't know how, men feel, but how you feel that you're invisible, 
and that that's helped. I don't think I've ever heard, how do I say this, a more powerful example of what that kind of thing can do to another human being, that kind of assault. Well, I don't think men realize what I think you're probably what right. they're doing. Right. The effect of what they're doing. Now you're here and someone will hear this, let's hope, and say, ah, who knows? I don't know if you can change how people think. I really don't. I don't. And I don't know if people care. My feeling is that they don't. Yeah. Right. And people who do that might not give a shit. So since you've been out that 10 years, nine years, 10 years, if my numbers are correct here, you've had multiple overdoses where you are somewhat regularly trying to end your life. And probably when you're not planning to end your life, you know, you're thinking about it and then stockpiling and all that goes into it. All the while people are around you a lot. So you have to be like quiet and secretive and super. Oh, it's quite interesting. I just found out that in the UK, we can now sign advanced care directives. So when you're older, you sign a DNR. I don't want to be resuscitated if I'm, you know, like, for example, my father with his oh. Alzheimer's, he didn't mm-hmm. want to be resuscitated. So an advanced care directive is that if I get a terminal illness or if I get a brain tumor or something, I have decided to refuse treatment. The only thing I want is to be made comfortable with pain treatment. I have then gotten to written a statement saying that in the case of overdose, I do not want CPR. I do not want any form of naloxone. I do not want any IV trips. I don't want to call an ambulance and I do not want to go to a hospital. Wait, 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 wait. Do they accept that? Yeah, it's a legally binding document. A lot of people do not know that this exists. I do have to say in Scotland and Wales, it's not a legally binding document. In Britain, it is. That's a suicide pact right there. Tell, tell me about it. Why do you think I signed it? When did you sign that? Two weeks ago. I had to have my family sign it as well. Would your father have been okay with that? No, my father was a very spiritual person. And yeah. he said, you can take as many overdoses as you want, but your day is chosen for you. So it'll work if that's your day. It's 18 overdoses. He might be right. He might be, but my next one might be my day. Right? It might be your day. So last year, before you signed this thing, somewhere in the time of finding this podcast, which is kind of irrelevant, but this is how we yeah. started the conversation, you OD'd? Yeah. Very badly. Your brother wasn't living in Moscow anymore, I imagine? Unfortunately not. <laughs> So I get taken to hospital and I was in the ICU for two weeks. I don't really remember a lot of it. They were pretty awful. Yeah, I was there for three weeks. And the only reason I got let out was because my father passed. And so we buried the next day. They had to let me out. And that's where I was diagnosed as very high functioning borderline personality disorder. You think they're right? You know, when I first delved into it, I was like, I didn't think so. And then there's a really, really good podcast called Psychology Unplugged. I listened to him again. I binged it and I was just like, shit, that's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. So were you borderline in the past, but it was undiagnosed? Probably so. I don't know. I've now got to have an assessment. I categorically don't want to be here, especially not without my father. It's been a year? No, five months. Do you have any idea? I think I know the answer here, but I'm going to ask why you haven't tried sooner? Again, it's sort of like there's all these people around me, and so it has to be done when there's not. I can hear someone in your home right now, right? You're never alone. I will be this week. My mother's gone. Do you think it's weird 
that when someone shares something like that, I don't say anything other than what I've said. Like, I don't try to talk you out of it. I don't try to give you a resource. I don't give you a phone number to call. I don't make any suggestions. I don't do any of that. No, not at all. And I'm quite glad you don't. No, me too. I'm so sick of people doing that. You've had plenty of that, I'm sure. Yeah. Odie? Actually, no. I'm pretty sure I know. You actually really don't. You might be surprised what I've learned on this podcast. No, because there's something that I haven't shared on this podcast. Well, pray tell. In 2009, I was able-bodied. It was my birthday, and I don't know if you remember that. That monstrosity of a Whole Foods on Columbus Circle. So I slipped on a grape, basically broke my pelvis. This is all pre-being paralyzed by it. And I had uh, two hip operations, a spine operation and two SI joint operations. Jesus. As they do in the U.S., I remember going to the, to the ER that day. They sent me home with what I didn't know and my boyfriend knew. And he was just like, he was so petrified. They sent me home with 180 oxycodone. I was high as a kite. Yeah, I would have been too. And I, I, I was a big weed smoker as well. So that combination was great. They then moved me very quickly onto fentanyl. Probably felt great too. Wonderful. I was, I'm not joking you guys, flying as high as a kite. Right. But they were giving me doses that were, could be considered illegal. Okay. So when you think about ending your life in the past, you OD'd. And now we're talking about fentanyl and stockpiling. And we're going to leave it at that. Don't want to give anyone any ideas, but okay. How many people know that we're talking right now? One. One of my care. I was going to ask you about your hospital stays. I mean, you've been in the hospital if you added up all the days for like a couple of years, probably. Probably. Both kinds of hospitals. Yeah. No, I know. If you were to share one thought, I know this is kind of a corny way to frame it. One thing that psych units, mental institute, all of those places where people that are not well go, what is the one thing more than anything they could be way better at? Being more human. Yeah. Treating us as humans. Sorry, my my dog is like <laughs> crying for his food. I love when we hear a dog's howl or bark. I do. What kind of dog do you have? French Bulldog. Uh, what, what's his name? Harvey. Harvey the French Bulldog. Is he like, I would imagine he is a uh, good company. Very. Do you think he knows when you're down? Oh, a hundred percent. Are you mostly down? No, I think he's more down than I am. <laughs> you got to help your friend out. You got to help Harvey out. He really suffered with my dad's passing. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was hard. He lost a buddy. How many people know about your most recent attempt? I don't think there's anyone that doesn't. How many people do you have in your life to have a conversation with that might even discuss the word suicide with? There are a lot. I just don't do it. I am very guarded and closed. I put on a happy face and I do the whole fake thing. And I've done it my whole life. Fucking tiring, sorry. But that's the way I was brought up. My mother didn't want to hear like about your problems and you don't talk about them. And we keep everything to ourselves. Right. Hence her comment. Oh, I remember the comment. Yeah. So you have maybe borderline personality disorder. Have you been diagnosed with anything else over the years that you think is accurate? Chronic suicidal ideation, chronic PTSD, and anxiety. How many medications do you take daily? Whether it's prescribed or, or not. I don't... That's what I was going to ask. Well, break them up for me. What, what, first, we'll go with prescribed and then other. Okay. Opioids prescribed. Yeah. Fentanyl and oxycodone. Mm-hmm. Mental health prescribed, Ambien, Flanapin, and Selexa. I tried ketamine, really did not like it. I thought 
I was going like loopy loop. Uh, <laughs> okay. No ketamine for you. No. Other than Harvey, what helps? If anything. I'm not like super depressed every day. I get up, I shower, I get dressed, I live, I function. Right. I watch Netflix, listen to podcasts, I go out, see people, I do things. Mm -hmm. It's not like I'm sitting in bed crying. I just, none of it doesn't do anything for me. It doesn't stimulate. I get come home every night and I'm like, why? What's the point? Yeah. Are you able to work? Yeah, I worked for three years. Um, I stopped last year when I had to like take care more of my dad. I don't know that I'm ready to go back into work. Um, I'm very type A and when I work, I work seven days a week and I don't do anything else and like that takes over my life and I don't allow myself to do anything else. And I don't know if I want to get into that space because it's very toxic to me. Yeah. Any myths or misconceptions? And it could be about anything that we've talked about. That's a tough question. I personally don't think it's selfish. And I know I'm going to get a lot of shit for that. Someone um, that I know recently committed suicide, a 50-year-old, and he had a six-year-old daughter. Yeah. And she said, I'm just so glad he's not in pain anymore. Wow. How old is she? Six. Wow. Okay. It's like, do you stay alive because it's selfish for other people, but your pain is not, that's not selfish? Like, it's my pain doesn't warrant being addressed. Right. That gets lost in the whole thing. Yeah. I I have to live for you who really doesn't give a shit, but it's selfish. Right. I don't buy that. When's your birthday? 9th of July. Oh, I'm 4th of July. Cancerians rock. Cancerians. I didn't even know that was a word, but I love it. How did you not know that's a word? Wow. Who's judgy? Yeah, I'm very judgmental. <laughs> Whatever. I don't, I don't never apologize for my stupidity. Believe you me. Um, one other question that I forgot to ask when somebody gets that kind of thing in a hospital that you got, can you sue them? Oh, like your section, they have the right to do anything they want. Oh, you mean the infection? Mm -hmm. No, because there's no telling like who would get it how you got it like did i get it from food did i get it from unfortunately right. there's just no I'm not saying you would have taken that route i'm just kind of curious about it yeah no there's there's just no no telling it's something that you just have to be really really careful about really make sure that every doctor and nurse that you're attended by has clean hands, is wearing gloves, is wearing, I mean, I know now after them, the pandemic they are, but before that, I don't know how careful they were. It's a tough one. You said, I'm not depressed, or that's the word you use, like, I'm not always depressed. Are you angry? Yes. I think if people have done it enough times, stop trying to save them. That's a note to others. Yes. Because another thing that happens, I had major seizures. In the hospital, I get a lot of like brain fog and a lot of all these things. We don't know exactly what's happened, but you don't know when you take an overdose exactly what happens. And so by you saving someone, you don't know the outcome and they may not live the life. Look at me. I'm no longer the person that, you know, once was. It's a very different life. And so at some point, You've got to be prepared that the outcome may not be what you think it is or what you want it to be. Be prepared for that, number one. And number two, it's just like if they're doing it that much, they're telling me something. And that goes back to my theory on it not being selfish. Right. That thing you signed, that newish thing, that was two weeks ago. Does that take in, does that in effect? 
it's in effect as soon as you get all the signings and witnessing and your GP witnesses it and signs it and everything. Yeah. So I've done it. Wow. I think we all should have drops. I'm a big believer in that. Me too. Is that Harvey that I hear? Oh, there he is. He's Oh, he's big. He weighs 18 kilos. Oh, he's a big boy. Let me see this. Oh my God, he is so cute. I didn't realize French bulldogs were that big. He's got a big old You're head. Such a cutie. His head is bigger than yours. Oh, uh, what a cute. He's oh, got... now he's like getting on the wheelchair. And he's <laughs> like, oh my God. Harvey, for our listeners, is um a medium sized French bulldog. He's got a beautiful black coat of fur and an adorable face with great big sticking out ears. He's perfect. But I, oh, there he is. Like his big old snouts right here in my face now. Virtual face. What else would you like to share? Sorry. Nothing. It's been a really good and interesting talk. I've enjoyed it. Me too. Thanks for talking. Thank you. Before we leave, tell me about the rest of your day. There is really not too much to tell. It's like quarter past six here. So. Oh, right. it's later there. Duh. I have a friend coming over for dinner, and then I don't know. What are you watching on Netflix right now? You said that you have Netflix. There is really nothing to watch right now. There's something. They have a lot of stuff. I know, but I'm like, I want like a bingeable series. Like, All right, I'll something. give you one. I'll give you one. You ready? One day. I watched it the other day. What'd you think? Cute. Did you like the way they ended it? You know, if you hear the podcast, I never really know how to end them. No. What it's do you think? It's kind of sad. Isn't it? talk this long and then it's like, oh, it's over. I know. I mean, I feel the same it's way. Like things have to end. I know. Don't they, though? Really? Yeah. So many layers. That truth of things. So many layers to that one sentence. Exactly. So I'm going to keep sending you my pictures of New York. You can guess where they are. That would be a really fun game for me. The secrets from Sari's phone. And you had shared with me that you uh, write all kinds of notes in there. You've got like a book. Whoever gets my phone gets gold. The posthumous gold. Yeah. Gonna get rich off of you. I would, wouldn't exactly say that, but. Maybe they'll just get a good read. Maybe they'll be like, oh, that makes sense. That's why she's such a fucking lunatic. <laughs> so. We're just trying to find the fucking words, whether they're written or spoken, so that people get us a little more. I think that's a big part of it. I completely agree. Completely and you could argue that's agree. a big part of this whole thing I'm doing here with this. Yeah, which I think is brilliant. I think it gives people a, an outlet to kind of just let, it's like word vomit, what's going on. You guys should name the pod, change the name of the podcast to Word Vomit. Absolutely. <laughs> I got a lot of work to do. All right. Thank you, Sean. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. As always, thanks so much for listening and all of your support. Special thanks to Sari across the pond in England. Thank you, Sari. If you are a suicide attempt survivor and you'd like to talk, please reach out. Hello at SuicideNoted.com on Facebook or Twitter slash X at Suicide Noted. Help us out, if you would, by rating and reviewing the Suicide Noted podcast. It helps people find it. It really does. And of course, we want more people to find it. Thanks for that. And that is all for episode number 208. Stay strong. Do the best you can. I'll talk to you soon.